This episode is sponsored by Witful. Murder is messy. But your meetings don't have to be. We are both absolute fiends for productivity tools. And with how many meetings and events and tasks we have to do every day, we'd be lost without Witful. That's right. Witful, W-I-T-F-U-L, the calendar-based organizational tool for individuals. It intuitively connects the people, meetings, notes, and tasks that make up your day. Witful is here to help you stay on top of it all with amazing tools like smart tags that attach information to meetings, tasks, and people so that you have the information you need at your fingertips when you need it. And tools like a smarter to-do list that helps keep your priorities straight. Witful helps people with Google calendars full of meetings to stay on top of everything. It's like having a second brain. And it can help you be the amazing leader you want to be. Go to witful.com, that's W-I-T-F-U-L dot com, to find out how Witful can make every day smoother and more organized. Welcome to a new world of work with Witful. Old timey crimey. I'm Christy. And I'm Amber. And we are here this week to bring you a case from true crime history featuring a guy who sucks. He does <laughs> suck. And his mother kind of sucks too. <laughs> Everybody kind of sucks here except for the victim. Yes. And so before we get started, uh, don't forget about our Patreon. You'll hear a little bit more about it later in the show. But I just wanted to uh, discuss what we talked about on the bonus episode this week. Amber, what did we talk about? Turnips. <laughs> what else? Orange peels. Orange peels. Yes, there was a lot of food in there for some There was reason. a lot of food. So it was weird deaths throughout history. So we talked about a lot of strange death. Yeah, deaths in, in manners that you would really never expect. It was kind of awesome. <laughs> yes, it was quite fun. So uh, hang on for later in the show, and you'll hear more about that. And we also have a shout-out for Paul, who sent us some books, and we used one of them for our sources this week. That is Psycho USA, Famous American Killers You Never Heard Of, by Harold Schechter. So uh, that and another book I used was Six Capsules, The Gilded Age Murder of, I'm going to not say the name, uh, so as not to spoil it, by George R. Deakle Sr. So if I reference Schechter or Deakle, you know who I'm talking about. Deakle. Deakle. So we're going to be talking about Carlisle, Harris, and Helen Potts. So Carlisle, he was born in 1868, was the first of seven children, although three of them died young. He had uh, a brother who was six years younger, and then throughout, you know but that seemed to be the closest in age, I think. Now, I have a lot about his mother because I started digging on her. It's not very frequently that we have a mother of somebody in a case who is somewhat famous. I did no digging on her, so this is all news to me. This is, this is going to be interesting because uh, she's, she's quite something. She was Frances Fanny McCready Harris, a children's writer under the pen name Hope Ledyard, she lectured on stuff like she would go to social purity meetings and give lectures. She sounds like a joy. Oh, yes. This is a temperance society that kind of seemed more interested in what people were doing in their bedrooms than what they were drinking. And so she married Charles L. Harris in 1868. They stayed together for a while until the last child was born. Uh, that was sometime after 1881. We don't have an exact date for that. And then they divorced or at least separated. Carl went to live with her. Not sure about the siblings, but I'm thinking it's likely. I mean... It's she, pretty likely she kept all the kids. In those days, it wasn't as likely for the mother, but she had income from her publishing and her lectures and everything. And I would imagine, you know, being Hope Ledyard, the 
famous children's writer would, would come off pretty well in custody battles. Yeah, I would think. If there was even one. So she had some interesting thoughts on raising kids, especially boys. She had a whole essay about how mothers should take it as a strong hint if their sons want to play with the neighbor boys, because the sons should want to play with their mother. And the mother should indulge that even if she has to neglect the housework. I can get on board with that last part. Yeah, I mean, ditches can wait. Your kids can't. And they're only kids for a little while. So, like, I'm on board with that part. But a strong hint if they want to play with the neighbor kids? Yes, really? because they should want to play with mommy. Freud would have a field day here. Absolutely, yes, yes. He would just sit down and stroke his beard and say, tell me more. <laughs> so Oedipus says what? <laughs> <laughs> so she was really adamant about boys staying home and mothers sacrificing anything, including friendships, to spend time with them. Here is a quote. This requires some self-denial, but after a while you will enjoy it thoroughly. Your calls on fashionable acquaintances will be neglected, but in ten years' time only your few dearest friends will care whether you have visited them often, while these children will then be grown to bright, sunshiny men and women with pleasant memories of home and, above all, of mother. While, if you will not spare the time to play with or amuse them, they may turn out pretty well, I admit, but it will be through no special help from you, and any memories they have of pleasures will be with no thoughts of mother in them. Okay, so basically, don't neglect your kids. Play with them a lot and often so they have good memories of you. But it feels like she's going too far. It does. It does. Don't let them play with others. Only mother. Yeah. This is very like Rapunzel's Tower kind of vibe. And and neglect your friends. You know, like I can understand priorities and everything. And we were actually just talking about this. We were off literally mic. just talking about how I, I feel my friends are going to stage an intervention <laughs> because I I blow them off on the weekends to spend time with my kids. But everybody needs some some me time, too. And everybody needs, you know. What is that? Our friendships can really enrich our lives. And she's saying, you know, abandon all that for the exclusion of your children. But you're going to be a more well-rounded individual who's better able to raise interesting and well-rounded children if you have more than just your children in your life. And that's fair. That's totally fair. So to me, you know, kind of, it kind of raised some, some questions. Now, Carlisle was seven when that particular essay was published. So you can take your guess on how he was raised. And uh, we, we have some hints on also how he was punished if he was a bad boy. Uh, this was an essay published was in... Was there spanking? No, just wait. <laughs> you'll, you'll hear. 1877, when he was maybe eight years old. Your little boy has been bad, okay? And now you're talking to him and you say, Yes, now, darling, mother loves you very much and she wants to help you to grow up a good man. Do you want to be a good, brave, strong man? Yes. Well, I'm going to help you to be good by whipping you for what you did wrong so that you will not forget so soon again and then you must lie still in bed till supper time. You whip him, not very hard to be sure, but it is the fact that Mama does it that is the punishment, and then you give him a good petting. Huh. You whip him. And then you pet him. And then you pet him. And make him lie still until dinner. Yes. And the thing that hurts him the most is that Mother did it. This is really sounding creepy. It's getting kind of twisted, isn't it? Yeah. Well, there's more. Oh, good. She tells a story in her book of meeting a new mother on a train who was afraid her baby, baby, would grow into an unruly child, so she told the young mother she should definitely whip him within the next six months. What the fuck? Yes. 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 And here is a bit from her speech to another social purity gathering in 1888 when Carlisle was 20. And this is kind of about relationships between boys and girls. She spoke of the habit New York girls had of writing to boys whom they had known but two weeks. Don't you know it cheapens your girls? What are you New York mothers thinking about anyway? 
The lady next took up the question of boys visiting girls in the parlors of their homes and being received by them alone. <gasps> Gasp! I know, right? If I had pearls, I'd clutch them. One of these days I'm going to wear my pearls. <laughs> Just so we can clutch them. <laughs> exactly, yes. She thought the mother should be present and help to entertain her daughter's friends. My mother, said Mrs. Harris, used to insist that I should have a piece of work in my hands. So like sewing, cross-stitch embroidery, you know, needlework, a piece of work in your hands. Idle hands are the devil's tools. Exactly, yes. Uh, a piece of work in my hands when young men called upon me. I never knew her reason until since my own children have grown up. I know now that it was done in order that my hands should be kept in their proper place. Then, too, a bright light is needed if one has work to do. Where, where, where might your hands be going there, uh, Mrs. Harris? Underneath their boutonniere. <laughs> like, it just feels really weird. And there's another lady, just as a side note, that really fascinated me. She also spoke at some of these meetings. She's a doctor from the New York Department of Health who is giving, giving Mrs. Harris a run for her money with the batshit declarations, all right? Oh, good. Oh, yeah, you're going to love this. She insists that purity of thought is needed as regarding men and their sons, quote, Years before those eyes saw the light or that little brain was called into existence, you had imparted to that child a tangible record of your life. I charge you, in the name of all you hope for, the future of your children, to protect them by your thoughts. That sounds like Scientology. My thought is um, sperm holds memories. And so if you're a, a naughty boy, uh, then your, your child will know of it because the memory of it is in the sperm that went to make him. Oh, okay. That's, that's my interpretation of that particular thought. Sure. Purity of thought. So you need to have pure thoughts even if you don't have a child because otherwise you will raise a demon or something. Pure thoughts only. Especially while fucking. Yeah, yeah. Good luck making the child without having any impure thoughts at all. Have fun with that. It's like through a hole in the sheet. Yeah, right? <laughs> apple pie, apple pie, apple pie. <laughs> <laughs> so her short stories, Mrs. Harris's, are interesting. She had one called The Queer Service Okay. that I could not find. I think it was printed in a book. There was one that was actually published in a newspaper, and I had to read it because the title was Anna's Fondlin. What, what? Yeah, that's exactly my reaction when I saw that. It's not anything like we think it is. It's still kind of odd. Uh, so it features a missing baby. The father, when the child goes missing, is careful not to mention Charlie Ross after the incident happens which was kind of an interesting callback for me. <laughs> and what happened was the mother left the baby carriage on the front stoop and then went inside and ended up falling asleep. And then when she woke up, the baby was gone. Was the carriage still there? Carriage was gone too. The mother said, oh, I would so much rather she had died. Huh? Yeah, I know. No, I, I, it's not, it doesn't feel realistic for some reason. I'd rather she be dead than missing. Okay. She'd only been missing a couple hours at that point. <laughs> like, if that. This stress is not worth it at all. <laughs> yeah. I hope she turns up dead. Yeah. And the, the fondling turns out to be a child's rendering of the word foundling. You know, as a, a, okay. a, a child that's found. Used to be like foundlings were thought to be maybe like fairies that had been like switched in the cradle. But... Who knows? Maybe they still believe that in the 1880s. I don't know. But what happened was two little girls had wandered past. They saw the baby in the stroller and they took it home because they wanted a little baby. And then we get this gem after they get the baby back and the husband wants to hire a nanny. She, she says to the husband, oh, John, if you'll only trust me again, I'm nurse enough. I don't like a great Irish girl. You can't trust them. Wow. Yeah, yeah. But he doesn't get a great Irish girl. He gets a dog that he shells out $2,000 in modern money for. So he gets a nanny dog. Essentially, yes. He's sure that nobody will ever try to take the baby with the nanny dog. But, you know, maybe just don't leave the baby on the front stoop. Yeah, maybe don't do that. But also, in Peter Pan, they had a nanny dog. Didn't work. Didn't work. Nope, nope. Those kids went off to Neverland. 
She also, in a book, Plain Talks with Young Homemakers, published in 1889. I hate this woman. No, no. Oh, yeah. She advises young housewives not to use Jamaica ginger, which was a patent medicine that contained 70 to 80 percent ethanol. So, okay. But rather to use sun cholera mixture, which I looked up and is equal parts cayenne, opium, rhubarb, peppermint, and camphor. Here are the directions. Mix well. Dose 15 to 30 drops in a wine glass of water according to age and violence of the attack. Repeat every 15 or 20 minutes until relief is obtained. So this is how to get fucked up. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> so drink until you can't feel things anymore. Done pretty, and done. Pretty much, yeah. And I was actually just last night listening to the, the Sawbones book. And they mentioned that in this exact time period, you know, opium was pretty big. And uh, two out of three morphine addicts were women. Which uh, it's starting to feel like Mrs. Harris was a part of that. <laughs> she might have been, yeah. So this is the kind of thinking in the environment Carlisle was raised in. His mother didn't let him play with the neighborhood boys. So when he did get to play outside the house, his friends were mostly girls. When I was reading in the Schechter book, I, I put a little sarcastic note playing doctor next mm -hmm. to that mm -hmm. that joke gets gets darker and has more layers as we go on <laughs> it gets way darker he dropped out of school around age 13 took up whatever odd jobs he could find he even dabbled in acting a little bit which uh, we don't know a lot about his father but i did find his father's name which granted is charles l harris not the most unique. Yeah, exactly. But in reviews of plays in New York City. So either his father was on the stage and he was going to go take after his father for a little while, or it's a coincidence. But you know what? That would make sense because the mother did not like him acting. So even after he landed a role and was maybe going to be successful, mm -hmm. she was like, no, no more. No. Yeah, she put a stop to that. She did seem to have quite a bit of control over his actions. To an extent. <laughs> to an extent. She couldn't control the ones she didn't know about, as far as we know. But the reviews from Charles L. Harris's plays that he was in, if that was indeed his father, uh, one of them called him intolerably bad. Oh, lovely. Another one called his physique portly, but did say he had a rich baritone voice. He had a lovely voice, a voice for radio. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, his mother hated the theater, forced him to quit. And then, according to Schechter, he did a few random jobs, like uh, he was a book salesman, an assistant purser, a clerk. And then he finally figured out what path he should take. And that was thanks to his maternal grandfather, who was a prominent doctor. And he's like, all right, well, hey, grandson, why not go into medicine like uh, grandpappy here? And I'll give you all the money for it. Yeah, that is really a, a, an offer you couldn't walk away from. Like, you can go into medicine and you can live with me and I'll pay for you to go to school. And he even got him into the school. Yeah. It was the College of Physicians and Surgeons in New York. So yeah, you kind of can't say no. And he did seem to take to it. Uh, he started in 1888. Schechter states, quote, quickly distinguished himself as a bright and conscientious student. By his sophomore year, he was assisting with surgeries. I don't like it. I don't like it one bit. I don't either. But here's the thing. And, and you can already kind of see this pattern. So Carlisle really likes being in the spotlight. With the acting, he was very successful. He was getting lots of attention. And then again, with being a doctor, it puts you kind of on the upper tier of society. He gets to live in a city. He gets away from his mother a little bit. And as long as he paints himself as a star pupil then he's going to get all this wonderful attention. And so he really wants that, like, name and lights kind of profession. Mm -hmm. So, yes, he's going to act like he's doing a great job. Bringing those acting skills into the uh, med school. And I think that's a lot of what was actually happening here. So, like, he might have had an interest in it, but his interest was really about getting the attention from it. Yeah, he was playing the part. Mm -hmm. And... In reality, he was not very good. No. 
he decided to specialize in obstetrics and gynecology. I am girding my loins. Yeah. <laughs> when Amber will actually say it, you know it's bad. <laughs> and that is very um, literal in this case. It's not always so literal, but the, the loins do need to be girded here. Uh, yeah. He spent the school years living with his grandfather in New York City and then the summers in Ocean Grove, New Jersey. Now, this is the kind of place where even today you have establishments like the Carriage House <laughs> and the Majestic. These are hotels you can stay at, sort of B&B-like. His mother had a place in Ocean Grove, and she would, over the summers, give her lectures on purity and temperance. So in 1889, he met, in Ocean Grove, Helen Potts. She was 18. She was described by Schechter as vivacious and radiant. She was a recent high school grad, had graduated with honors, a gifted pianist, and, quote, beloved only daughter of doting parents, a well-to-do father, George Potts, who had made his fortune in railroad construction, and a mother, Cynthia, whose primary concern was keeping a watchful eye on her high-spirited daughter. I just want to point out the synchronicity of doing this case the week that I just randomly started watching Gilded Age on HBO. <laughs> I didn't even know that was a show. It just popped up. I was going to go watch uh, the next season of Succession, which I still haven't gotten to, and it, Gilded Age, and it has, like, the costumes, and it's from, like, that time period that I'm fascinated with, and I was like, well, I guess I'm watching this. It's okay. Great costumes. I'm enjoying them. Newspapers described Helen as buoyant, hopeful, and cheery. And we have a description of her from Carlisle Harris himself. He said, quote, She was the most beautiful girl I ever saw. She was tall, with remarkably large, dark eyes, an olive complexion, and possessed that crowning glory of all, a mass of chestnut hair. Christ Almighty, he's describing a young adult fantasy heroine. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's what it sounds like. Any minute now, she's going to become the chosen one. Any minute. I bet her bosoms danced when she laughed. Ah, <laughs> oh, dancing bosoms. <laughs> Crazy boobs. <laughs> so Harris starts calling at her house, and they went out and about doing fun summer at the coast things that you do when you're wealthy and young, like boating and picnics. Schechter notes that they weren't always accompanied and, in fact, did spend a lot of time alone together. For shame. And that Harris was pretty insistent in trying to get her to do something sexual with him. He, uh, he, he made his end goal pretty clear. Yeah. The fall after they met, Helen started up school at the New York College of Music, and her family moved to New York City for that. They weren't even that far from where Harris was attending college. Uh, they got at an apartment on West 63rd, and he was going to school on West 59th. So he could just pop by all the time. Which he did. Yes, he did. And uh, Helen's mother, Cynthia, started to kind of feel like it was getting to be a bit much. I love my notes. She's like, she asked Carlisle to tone it the fuck down. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what she did, yes. Her concern was that, quote, something might grow of the friendship that would be a disadvantage, end quote, to Helen. So she's thinking this might turn into a romance. I don't really know if he's the one for her yet. And he said, okay, fine, I'll, I'll come by less. But no, he, he kept coming over just about at the same rate as before. And a few months later, as 1890 dawned, once again, Cynthia Potts was like, dude, cool it. And he, in response to that, he starts talking about marriage. It's like, she's like, hey, you need to lay off a little bit. He's like, oh, marry your daughter? You want me to marry your daughter? Well, and she shut that shit down. Oh, yeah. She, she was like, no, my daughter is too young. She's got a bright future. You're still in school. Don't you dare ask her. Do not. Yeah, yeah. She, she's just like, no, this is not happening. You're, you need to finish your shit and actually become, you know, successful to the point that you can sustain a household. Because right now you're living with your grandfather and he's paying for everything. Which makes sense. I mean, it, it really does. Like, 
you're just a kid going to school. She's just a kid going to school. Neither one of you has a job. Everybody else is paying for all of your stuff. You cannot get married and still continue to live the way that you're living. So somebody's going to have to drop out of school. Somebody's going to have to get into the workforce. And no, like tone it the fuck down, man. Chill. Don't you dare. (laughs) Yeah, just cool your heels, bro. So he said, okay, fine, I'll back off. But once again, he did not. Not great at following instructions. No, he's following his heart on is what he's doing. Yeah, he really is. He's he's following his dick around. About a month passed, and on Sunday, February 8th, he came by and said he wanted to take Helen into the city to do a little sightseeing. Helen's mother gave her permission, and they were downtown for about five hours. They came back. They told her all about their day. They had gone to the New York Stock Exchange. They had seen the New York Tribune building that was designed by a famous architect. They'd gone out for a fancy lunch. And they had such a wonderful time. Such a delightful time that it was utterly befuddling when he stopped coming around after that. He maybe came around sometimes, but even when he did, he wasn't as polite, he wasn't as cheerful as he'd been before. And this was noticed. Both Helen and her mother noticed, and Helen was distraught at this. She thought she had, you know, a nice young man, and then something went wrong. Even when Summer came back again, and they were back in Ocean Grove, and he didn't have school, he was still distant. And Cynthia Potts said, quote, When there were musicals or concerts or anything of the kind, he did not care to go. He made appointments with my daughter to take her out to church twice and did not keep those appointments. His manner was as if he was bored and tired of their friendship. So he's doing the, you know, blowing hot and cold. I love you, I love you, I love you. Let's go and sightsee and I want to marry you. And then boom, just turns it all off. I wonder what could have happened. I wonder... Indeed. Yes. So he comes by in June and he takes Helen for a walk. They were actually gone for half the day from morning until early evening. She came home and something wasn't right. Something was just, you know, her mother could tell. And Helen went straight to her room and her mom figured, oh, well, you know, she gets these migraines. So it's probably just that again. Didn't, Didn't think a lot of it. But then more time passes, a week goes by, and Helen is still unwell. So she goes off to Scranton, Pennsylvania, to see her uncle, who was, of course, a doctor, because all of these people have doctors in the family. All of them, yes. I feel like that's, like, when when you're well-to-do, you have to have a doctor in the immediate family. Yeah, somebody's got to do it. It's a rule. Mm -hmm. I don't think I even know anybody with a doctor in their family. Well, I'm not well-to-do. Nor am I. I'm not going to be going to the New York Stock Exchange or going, you know, boating. Maybe I'll have a picnic. (laughs) Maybe a picnic, yes. Yes, I can afford that. There's definitely no tennis parties in my future. (laughs) Yes. She goes to see her her uncle, and he sees immediately that she's not doing so hot. Actually, I want to back up because I think it's interesting that she goes all the way to Scranton. I don't know whose idea this was. If this was her idea, if it was her mother's idea. That's a little under three hours today from Ocean Grove to Scranton. In those days, probably longer. So she takes this long trip when she's not feeling well. Are there no doctors in Ocean Grove? I I feel like she knew what, what she needed to do, and that was go see somebody who she could trust and who was not in, in the town that she lived in. Yeah, and it might have even been the mother is like, I think you need to get away, maybe assuming that they had like a fight or a breakup and was like, let's get you out of town. You can stay at at my sister's house and her husband is a doctor. And so this is all going to be okay. You're going to get a doctor. You're going to get a week away. You can take your mind off of your troubles. Yeah, something it's something like that. But I really feel like I feel like some of this was Helen making decisions here because they they kind of line up with what her motivations might have been to, let's say, um, keep something uh, hidden. Secret. Yeah, keep a secret. So Uncle Charles, the doctor, sees immediately that she's not doing so hot. She has pale skin. 
Her appetite is poor. She has lethargy. She has nausea. Especially in the morning hours. Well, how strange. And he had to talk her into letting him give her an actual exam. And when he was able to, he discovered that, of course, as you all saw coming, she was pregnant. Then he found out there was a little more to it than that. A little more? She was not only pregnant, she was married. Bum, bum, bum! And had been since February. So for four months now, instead of going to the New York Stock Exchange and such, they'd gone off to City Hall and gotten married under fake names. Aliases. Yeah, so she's not really married. Really. Really, yeah. And it's all confusing to me because why was City Hall open on a Sunday? And if you get married under a fake name, are you actually married? Uh -uh. I I feel like not. I feel like you need to actually have your name in there. And that was one of the things that kind of confused me about this whole thing because she was not going to put out until she was married, Mm -hmm. which is where his motivation is. But the married under fake names thing, I don't know why she would ever agree to that. Because it's not recognized in church, because you did it at City Hall. It's not recognized by the law, because you did it with fake names. So what the... I, like, I don't understand the logic of, let's get married under fake names. For what? I think... I don't know for sure, but it's possible she didn't know. Symbolism? Let's say he fills out the paperwork. Oh, could be. Okay. And then let's say the, the, the person who performed the, the, the marriage, you know, runs them through some vows and only says, do you, Helen, take, and then he had, his fake name was Charles, take Charles. And he's like, oh, no, don't worry. It's Carlisle's a nickname, you know, or something like that. So if he hides it from her, then there's no question. She, she just thinks that they're married under their names because she, she kept her first name for the alias and just took on a false surname. Well, her real name isn't even Helen, though. That's her middle name. Her real first name is Mary. Yeah, I don't know. She might have not thought about it. She she may have known, for all we know, that they were getting married under fake names, and he talked her into it somehow, and the symbolism was enough, you know? Maybe. I don't know. There was still more to it. Her darling husband had tried to give her an abortion and had made an absolute wreck of the job. And actually, did I say something? (laughs) No, just girding my loins. Yep, yep. This is a a gird your loins episode. I just might make that the whole subtitle. So that it's right there. Sorry, ladies, you're going to be crossing your legs a lot and doing Kegels whether or not you're trying. Yep, yep. (laughs) Clench it all. Just clench it all. Now, the book Six Capsules has this actually being the third pregnancy and abortion. Yeah. I, I I didn't stumble upon that until, like, well into my research. For her? Yeah. Oh, man. Harris performed two, and then uh, the first one, I guess he had some doctor that Helen didn't even know. He took her to this, you know, back alley butcher and had him do it. I did not know that. Yeah. It's astonishing. So, yeah, she's been through a lot. Uncle Charles sends for this incredible douchebag himself, threatening to expose everything if Carlisle didn't come clean up his mess. He even ends the letter after he signs it, I mean business. Wow. Yes. Carlisle Harris comes and he basically is the most blasé motherfucker you've ever seen. He's like, what's the matter? I do this shit all the time. I've, I've given five abortions to five previous girlfriends and they were all fine. This What's is, wrong with her? This is how I do things. This is fine. Yeah, he literally tells her, after Helen's out of the woods, he literally tells the uncle that he'd, he'd done this to five young ladies. And they were all perfectly fine and recovered nicely. So it must be something wrong with her, obviously. And you can imagine the astonishment when, uh, you know, Harris whips out his medical bag and is like, okay, well, I'll just finish this off. You know, I'll, I'll take care of, uh, I'll fix it up. Oh, so he stuck up for himself by saying, well, she was hemorrhaging quite a lot at the time, but I thought I got it all. Yeah, basically. Ugh. So gross. Clench everything. Harris is in Scranton. 
And, you know, when you're out of town, you want to see the sights, right? Even if your purported wife is, you know, uh, suffering badly from the miscarriage you messed up. Well, you know, Harris goes out and about, and uh, he he saw the sights, which it was coal mines and steel mills, with Helen's cousin, Charles Oliver. Can we have somebody whose name is not Charles? No. No, apparently not. I actually looked. And there's a, a list of the, you know, cast of characters or whatever in Six Capsules in the beginning. And I did a control F for Charles <laughs> in that there are in this book 10 other Charleses, not including Carlisle Harris's father and when Carlisle Harris used Charles as an alias. Wow. Yes. And so while they're out and about visiting coal mines and steel mills, Harris tells this kid, Charles Oliver, his, you know, his whole life story. All of his little tricks for getting underneath that bustle. Yeah, he's like, I've fucked a ton of ladies. Exactly. That was pretty much what he said. And he's like, and here is how you do it. You think I'm going to show you how to how to turn on the charm or how to use your smooth moves? No. You just get some whiskey and pour that into her ginger ale. Get some every time. Almost. Almost. Almost Except for twice. Time. Except for twice. Yeah. Quote, a little whiskey and ginger ale and you have them in your power. By that, he means passed out. Yeah. So he is a prolific ra- rapist. I almost said racist. <laughs> he, he was probably that too. Honestly. I mean, it was that time period. Yeah. So there's there's... Every possibility that he was a racist rapist. Yeah. Oh, and Carlisle's a cunt <laughs> at the end of the day. Yeah. So he really is just absolutely terrible. So like we said, he had an alternate plan if the, you know, 1890s version of roofing a girl didn't work. Just promise to marry her in secret. And well, here might be another reason that Helen might have gone for this if she knew about the fake name. It's all romantic. It has that touch of rebellion and drama. You have this little secret to giggle over together. You know, it it kind of has a little attraction in that vein. So that could be part of it for her. Oh, we'll we'll elope in secret. And it'll just be our little secret. And then eventually she's like, no, but it needs to not be a secret anymore. (laughs) I'm knocked up. (laughs) Yeah, it needs to not be a secret because I'm a respectable one. Yes, exactly. And so, uh, as the papers put it, quote, he had never met but two young women who had moral scruples strong enough to resist him, and he had overreached them both by secret marriages. I just want to just raise a little bit of a qualm by blaming the moral scruples of these young ladies that he basically drugged with whiskey. Yeah. Just, I just, I just have a little problem with that. I don't know why. Let's get them drunk, and then I can fuck them. And if that doesn't work, I'll secret marry them, fuck them, and leave them. Yeah, yeah. And yet it's the women's fault. Yeah. How dare they? And then he explained to Helen's cousin that, you know, yeah, you might knock her up, but then you just give her an abortion. He says, I've done that twice, too. Well, with two different women. That's why I got into medicine. Gosh. (laughs) Apparently, yeah. Why do you think I want to be an OBGYN? Now... We never learn for certain the name of his first wife, and we'll get to why soon enough. And there's a whole story there. But focusing on Helen Potts, she was, of course, the second wife. I mean, she didn't know that. And so that was why he seemed so distant and rarely came around after that February day, is he wanted to hit it and quit it. He had hit it, so it was time to quit it. Yep. So Helen's uncle fixes her up. And it's pretty clear that Harris really botched this. Oh my gosh. The fetus was still there. The head was wounded from whatever the fresh hell he was doing during that attempted abortion. I'm not going to go into too many details about the whole thing. But do please know that they induced labor when Dr. Uncle Charles was trying to get her back to health by giving her rectal injections of hot water. Wow. Brings a whole new meaning to the phrase, you're in some hot water, Missy. I did not know that that is what they did, because I had that they administered drugs to her. They did that, too, yeah. To induce the labor. I didn't have anything about the hot water enema, because, my. 
Yeah, yeah, that's um something. It's something. They did a lot of butt stuff back then. They really did. Yeah, they they were secretly really loving the butt stuff. Yeah. So the butt was the key to everything. The butt is the key to life. So meanwhile, Carlisle Harris is long gone. He's off to find another young lady who ends up being Queenie Drew, age 17, and the two shack up in a luxury hotel in Canandaigua, New York for a while. There's some speculation that they also married, but it's never confirmed one way or the other. And Queenie Drew tells a story of how Carlisle had this idea that she could marry an old man with money and they could kill him. And he said he knew of a pill that would do the trick. Bum, bum, bum. Very bum, bum, bum. Helen is recuperating this time, and it's not always clear she's going to make it, but finally she does pull through. They let her mom in on the story in August of 1890, and she comes out to Ocean Grove and helps Helen get back to 100%, or as close to it as she can be, after, like, three abortions in the past year, so she can go home. I just saw Amber make the face that I know means she's clenching. She's girding and clenching. Girding and clenching. (laughs) And uh, it's around this time as well, August of 1890, when Carlisle Harris, mommy's goodest boy, was arrested for running a booze and gambling joint called the Neptune Club. Hey there, beloved listeners. If you're enjoying this episode, then you absolutely should check out our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash oldtimeycrimey, which is the absolute best way you can support the show and get something in return. For just $5 a month, you get five bonus episodes a month. On the Patreon, we frequently talk about old-timey crimes you won't hear about anywhere else. Crimes that have been forgotten by time and erased by history that you won't read about on Wikipedia, Murderpedia, or really any pedia. We also delve into the old newspapers, for the wacky wild crimes like the thieving lion tamer and the spaceman intruder. Or talk about strange, delightful customs like nutting day while learning about the time people rioted over cheese. (laughs) (laughs) We can't even talk about it in our own promo without giggling. I love nutting day. (laughs) Nutting day is the best day. So come check out the Patreon for more of the weirdest, wildest and most shocking old-timey crime that's patreon.com slash old-timey crimey where's the link (laughs) in the show notes (laughs) i knew i was not gonna get through nutting day without giggling this was about the kind of raid on the house Harris and his associates occupied the whole house, and while soda water and light refreshments were being served to pious people downstairs, New Yorkers and other visitors were bucking the tiger upstairs, it is said, and imbibing all the strong drinks they chose to order. Bucking the tiger. No, we talked about this at one point because there was that game, uh, that, that gambling game. Yeah, I know. That's just such a funny sentence. Though. And there, there, were, there were tigers on the cards, so they call it bucking the tiger. I think one of my favorite descriptions of the Neptune Club was, quote, orgies were a nightly occurrence. (laughs) I know they probably didn't mean orgies the way that we do, but I just... What the hell else did they mean? uh, Raucous parties? Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Naked ones. (laughs) Naked ones. Uh, It is said, and imbibing all the strong drinks they chose to order, the sign over the door of the club is Neptune Club. For members only. The police sent a decoy ahead to ring the bell of the outer door, and when it was opened by Harris, they rushed upstairs. There were no members of the club present at the time, and it is supposed the police did not make the raid at night when the games are in full blast for fear they would be compelled to arrest some of the prominent men in town. Of course. Of course. The club has been run in a very open manner for some time, and the names of some city officials and many prominent New Yorkers are on the rolls. It is supposed that the real object of the police was to get possession of these documents, as the managers of the club have boasted that the authorities did not dare pull the house. That's from The Sun in 1890. 
And Harris would go on to verify that bit about prominent men uh, when he spoke to a detective Joy. That just, that doesn't work. No. No, you needed to go into another line of work, buddy, with that name. Detective Joy of New York testified that liquor was sold in the club rooms and that gambling also carried on there. All three prisoners were held to await trial. Mr. Harris says two of the town commissioners and the town council are members of the club. So he'd been running this all under the alias Charles Harris, which was his dad's name, or possibly Charles Harkness. It could be that just some paperwork was messed up, smudged, or maybe he had a couple different names he was running with. His mom bailed him out the next day, and his excuse was he just ran the cafe downstairs. He had no idea there was anything untoward going on upstairs, and for some reason everybody in the town seemed to buy it. And his reputation didn't really take a hit from this. You can get away with a lot, I guess. You just played dumb. Yeah. So it's fall of 1890. Carlisle Harris is back in New York City for med school after his very eventful summer. And finally, after dead silence from him for a month, Helen's mother, Cynthia, summons him to meet her for lunch in New York. That's where she says, why? Why did you do this? Why did you sneak around to marry my daughter only to abandon her after you knocked her up? And... He said, I thought we might someday get tired of each other. And if we were married under false names, we could just drop the matter and no one would be the wiser. Yep. I want to do it this way so we can just um, not do it anymore. Yeah, yeah. Cynthia Potts is like, well, to hell with that, because you two are getting for real married right the hell now. He says, okay, sure. But, you know, I'm in medical school. It's very important that I focus on my studies. But then after that, it's marriage ahoy. He's also using the court case for the Neptune Club as an excuse. You know, he doesn't want to drag her into that. But he says that when that's behind him, they can marry. And he's even got plans for Helen and is having Cynthia act on them. Because he says, you know, I'm going to be a successful physician. And I want my wife and I to be able to be part of society. You know, the hoi polloi. So... We need to train her. And so he had her enroll in a fashionable finishing school where they would teach her all the things she'd need to know to be out in society. She gets into the school and moves in with three roommates who are fellow students. And at this point, I really don't even know where to put this in my notes, so I just kind of shoved it in. He had burned the marriage certificate. Oh, I didn't know that. I mean, of course, there's a copy at City Hall, but... (laughs) <laughs> I did think it was interesting that Helen's father is not aware of any of this. Yeah. Well, he's a railroad man, so he's traveling a lot. He is traveling a lot, but Cynthia also said that she did not want him to know of their daughter's shame. Yeah, yeah. And so she didn't tell her own husband that their daughter was married and had uh, gotten pregnant and had an abortion. Like, none of it. He knows none of it. He's totally in the dark. Carlisle Harris keeps procrastinating on the marriage into uh, 1891, and Cynthia Potts is getting sick of his shit. She wants everything fixed and solved now. She tells him that, well, you know, you guys may as well just have one anniversary, and that's coming up, February 8th. So you'll get married on that day for realsies this time, and everything will be settled. He said, yeah, okay, sure. And then he went to the pharmacy. The same day. The same day, yeah. Like, right after. It's a few more days before he sees Helen, and when he does, he has a little something to help with her migraines. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, huh? He gives her four pills and says, take one of these before bed every night. He tells her that they're just quinine tablets. There were two pills he didn't give and kept to himself so she couldn't accidentally overdose, he said. Now, quinine is uh, usually like more for malaria, and uh, it's also in tonic water. Oh, did not know that. So get a little, get a little quinine with your G and T. Then he left on vacation. You know, out of town, out of state, out of mind. Bye bye. Caught a steamer to Chesapeake Bay. Going down Old Virginia Way. 
Back in the city, Helen is dutifully taking her pills at night, but they seem to be making things worse rather than better. She even sent him a letter jokingly chastising him for making her feel worse, saying he was a very bad doctor and his medicine made her head swim. She even told her mom that she wanted to throw the last pill out. And Cynthia later said, quote, I told her that quinine was apt to make one feel wretched, but I thought it would do her good, so I advised her to take it. So that night... Helen took it. Her roommates were off at the sympathy. Sympathy? <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. No, not yet. No, no, there'll be some sympathy soon. Her roommates were off at the symphony, and when they got home, she was out cold. The noise of their return and them getting ready for bed wakes her up a little bit, and she says, Girls, I have had such beautiful dreams. I wish they could go on forever. Yeah. And then it seems like something just hits her really hard. She's numb, her throat is too tight to swallow, and she says, I feel like I'm dying. So, in my notes, because before she says this, um, they they heard her groan, and she goes, I feel so queer, girls, <laughs> and I have me too, Helen. <laughs> and then she says, I can't feel your hand at all, as one of her roommates was stroking her head. And then I believe I am dying. But I just thought that was great. I feel so queer, girls. Me too. You too. So they get the school doctor. She's basically in a coma at this point. Uh, his name is Dr. Fowler. He gets two other doctors and they try everything they can think of. I mean, it really runs the gamut here. So it's, it's, it's quite a roller coaster of legitimate medical treatments and what the doing so artificial respiration uh, various injections like whiskey atropine and digitalis coffee enemas it, it black coffee enemas and i'm like thanks for ruining coffee for me this morning as i was drinking coffee and writing the notes i'm like nope 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 i need not this now <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right and electric shocks, uh, it seems like, you know, the very early version of what we have today with the paddles and everything. I think they actually use a galvanic battery to get an electric current going and then slowly turn it up. She's still unconscious. Some reports have her kind of rallying around 2 a.m. And the doctor thought she would recover, so he went home. But within two hours, she was down for the count again. So maybe, you know, it was just all the, the whiskey and the coffee enema and the battery and shocks. The doctor is trying to get to the source of this. And he finds the little container of pills that is now empty. Uh, it's either got Harris's name on it as the prescriber or someone tells him that she got the pills from Harris. So Harris is just back in town. They get him in there. Helen's been unconscious with labored breathing for seven hours and Harris's reaction is basically, oh, those pills were nothing. They couldn't have hurt her. And then he says, quote, do you think I will be held responsible? And the doctor literally tells him, I don't care about you. I'm trying to save her. Yeah, like he asked the doctor several times, like, do you think this is going to come back to bite me? And he's just like, dude, shut the fuck up. I'm trying to save this girl's life. Like, is this a problem? Is this going to affect my future? What a narcissist, though. Like, oh, my gosh. Your wife, your wife is literally dying. And you're just like, mm, do you think people are going to, like, question me about this? I didn't do anything wrong. Because, you know, I've got a lot scheduled. I do not have time for questions. Yeah, Harold Schechter pins him as a malignant narcissist. And that sounds about right. He's not wrong. Yeah, he's, he's malignant as they get. After a few more hours of working on her... She finally passes around 10 a.m. It is February 1st, seven days before their one-year anniversary, and also seven days before they were supposed to get married again, or for the first time, depending on how you look at it, I guess. <laughs> and then fucking cunt Carlisle. <clears throat> she dies, and he just goes, my God, what will become of me? Mm-hmm. It's all about him. 
Nobody like, else matters in the, in this. Nobody else. Not her grief-stricken family. Not her friends. No. The only thing that matters is him. Blows my mind. And then, like, I'm, I'm just imagining he's probably, like, surrounded by these doctors that have been up all night long trying to save her life, doing the artificial respiration, just trying to keep her heart going. And they're, like, sweating and exhausted and so sad that they couldn't do it. And the roommates are probably in tears. The headmistress, I'm picturing in the corner, just like wailing. And he's just like, what about me? Well, fuck. (laughs) How is this going to affect me? I'm the most important person in every room. At first, the papers say the death was caused by heart disease. And they're also saying that all the doctors say that Harris is not at fault, and even Cynthia Potts says so, from the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. Her greatest comforter throughout the day has been young Harris, for whom she has no blame. That writer was wrong. Now, he's saying that maybe the pharmacist didn't compound the pills right. There, you know, he had asked for some morphine to be put in there, but not an amount that could kill anybody. And there are ideas floating about that they maybe accidentally reversed the quantities of morphine and quinine. The pharmacy owner is interviewed. He's been in this business for 50 years, and they discover that the drugstore has a specific, quote, poison department where they kept the drugs that could also be poison. I mean, they knew. They, they literally said there, there's... There's the poison department where we keep all the poisons, you know, all the drugs that can easily kill people. So, you know. Pretty sure they were cautious about the poison that they put in things. Well, their system was that they would have one clerk filling the prescription and another clerk overseeing them. So they had kind of like a a, a double check system so that they couldn't be. A buddy system. Exactly. So that it couldn't be messed up. The death certificate is even filled out with heart disease listed as the cause. The son reported that Cynthia Potts told them that Helen had had a bad fall around age five and had been in poor health ever since, and that another doctor had told her two years before that she had valvular disease of the heart and not to, quote, take any violent exercise or to walk too much, end quote, and uh, doctors back then, Jesus. Even doctors now. True, true. There are also reports that Helen had told Harris she had malaria as well as migraines, hence the quinine. <laughs> like, where'd she get malaria? Yeah, I don't think that happened. <laughs> was, was New York City just a hotbed of malaria in February 1891? So I do have a rant here. Yeah. She had said that these pills were making her feel sick and that she wanted to throw that last pill out the window. For the love of God, listeners, if your body is telling you something, listen to it. Don't listen to anybody else. If you have a bad feeling, trust it. Just trust it. Your body is trying to tell you something. And for the love of God, fuck everybody else. Trust what your body is saying. Yeah, I recently had uh, some medicine prescribed to me that, that ended up having some, some bad effects that it was hard for me to recognize. But once I finally recognized what was going on, I got up, and I, I know this is horrible for the environment and everything, but I needed those pills to be in the garbage. So I took them and I put them in the garbage. <laughs> I was like, I can't, I cannot, I, I, I never want to take these again. And they, Doctors yeah. tell you bad information all the time. Even now, it was probably more so back then. But listen to your body, not the doctor. Go see a different doctor if they tell you something like <laughs> that you don't agree with or you don't feel is correct. Get another opinion, for the love of God. Yeah, and another rant. another opinion from a doctor. Don't don't you know? Do your own research. <laughs> I mean, you can do your own research, and, and you then certainly go can. To and a advocate and for yourself. Like, yeah, just advocate for yourself. But if if you have a doctor, like for example, I was told that I can't have kids. Imagine my shock. <laughs> When I was in boot camp and found out I was four months pregnant. Yeah, that would definitely be a shock. But I can't do that. Well, apparently I can. (laughs) So don't always listen to doctors. They don't always know best, but they try. But they don't always know. They do try. And medicine is so broad and still an ever-evolving field 
that it's got to be impossible to keep up with everything. But there are some some doctors that are just so arrogant that they'll pass themselves off as being knowledgeable about something even even when they're not. Like I had that doctor who gave me the Botox injections for my sweating, and it turned out that he did it incorrectly. He only gave me like five shots, and it's supposed to be like a grid on your hand, and then there's like a shot every like centimeter in the squares. It, like that was a waste of my time and everything. And not, not only that, I got shots in my freaking hands. It didn't work. And he always like guilt tripped me after the sessions. He would be like, oh, you probably hate me now. I feel so bad for me. And I'm like, what the? I'm the one who just had needles shoved into my hands. Can we focus on mm, me? Narcissism. <laughs> yes. Oh, anyhow, so good rant. See a professional, but listen to your body too, I think is, is what it comes down to. By the time they get the body for burial, the coroner seems to be having second thoughts about the cause of death. He telegraphed for them not to bury the body, and Helen's father was, he was... Totally on board. Mm -hmm, Yeah. He thought she might still be alive. He'd seen a flush on her cheek, and he thought any moment now she'll wake up. So he had two men guarding her casket to check hourly and see if she'd awakened. And in the newspaper where they talk about this, one column over, directly in the next column, is the headline, Slept Nine Months, Grace Gridley's Sudden Awakening from an Unusually Long Nap. The doctor's puzzled, no loss of flesh or vitality, the sleeping beauty of Amboy. Right next to that. Yeah... It's like, you know, that's on purpose. You did that on purpose, bastards. So it does seem like they did bury her after three days. There was an inquest, and Harris used the two pills he'd held back, supposedly to prevent her from overdosing, to show that they only contained what he said they'd contained. The coroner's jury does come back with a finding that she died of an overdose of morphine, but doesn't hold anyone responsible. Finally, about a month after Helen's death, it's all out in the open. Her mother comes out in the paper with the truth of her secret marriage and the pregnancy and the illegal operation, as they like to call it. And then there's some weird delays due to uncertainty of jurisdiction. And I'm like, no, just just get him. And they finally arrest Harris on a charge of murder. His bail is set at $10,000. That's $320,000 today. There was a little comedy there when they accidentally arrested his brother first, who for some reason was at Harris's lawyer's office, where Harris was supposed to be, and they arrested him and he refused to answer any questions until he got in front of a judge. And he was then at that point, he was like, um, yeah, I'm, I'm his brother. I shouldn't be here. (laughs) Why didn't you tell us that from the beginning? They also finally exhumed the remains. Now we have, oh, dear Lord, uh, Chemical analysis being done on the pills by doctors Tshep and Fingston. Or maybe Whoa, right Sh- off the tongue. Shep and Fingston, but Shep starts with a T and Fingston starts with a P. So somehow they managed to get two doctors with silent consonants. Pterodactyl doctors. <laughs> yeah, pterodactyl doctors. I like it. So they did the analysis of the pills and Professor Whithouse checked the stomach contents. He tested them by injecting what he believed to be chloride of morphine from the stomach into a live frog, quote, which went into a state of insensibility for an hour or two and then became normal again. The autopsy showed that 55 days after dying, Helen Potts still had morphine in her stomach while there were no traces of quinine. And that, I think, is the key. There is. No trace of quinine. Mm -hmm. That pill was 100% morphine. I'm almost certain of it. I really wish she would have checked it out the window like she wanted. I know. Of course, being under arrest for murder, uh, Carlisle Harris is kicked out of med school. Uh, He's being called in the city, quote, the vilest wretch ever vomited out of hell. I love that. I love it. It does take a while for the trial to get going, but in January 1892, they finally get to it. Judge Recorder Smith 
takes the helm. I kept on seeing, they just referred to him in, in many places after he was established as a judge as Recorder Smith. I was like, wait, is that like a title? Is that like a, a clerk of courts or something like that? Is it like recorder of deeds and marriages or whatever? No, his name, his actual first name was Recorder. I can't complain. At least it's not Charles. At least it's not Charles. <laughs> he can be, he can record all he wants. On the first day, the Boston Globe reported, already 28 ladies, most of them young women, had gained entrance and ensconced themselves in the first two rows of chairs where they could feast their eyes on the prisoner, munch their caramels and bonbons, and listen to the testimony. That makes me want to punch the reporter. And there were hundreds of male spectators, so, yeah, they can just Were they also eat eating their bonbons? Right? Fuck you. Oh, it's so condescending. The prosecution said in their opening statement that they would have a bunch of expert witnesses what they weren't allowed to talk about was one witness they would not get, and that was Harris's first wife. So in six capsules, George R. Deagle Sr. notes that during the trial, the district attorney got word of a Lulu Van Zant, who several years ago had married a guy that she knew as Charles Harris. That's what he put down on the marriage certificate. And then she found out afterwards that he wasn't Charles Harris. He was Carlisle Harris. And in this case, Lulu was 14 and the boy she quote unquote married was 16. The main problem here is that they found the marriage certificate and it took place in 1880. The birth year we have for Carlisle Harris is 1869. So he would have been about 11. The theory is that his birth year got kind of fudged a little bit. So he was actually maybe 14 or 16 when that happened. So say he was born in 1865. He'd have been 15 when he married Lulu, knocked her up and gave her an abortion. Because yes, she got the same treatment as Helen. And then he'd have been around 26 when he did that to Helen. I have a theory. Because the funny thing about the age thing is we, we know his exact age down to the day. I don't know if there are any like census records or anything or his birth certificate, but we have his mother saying at one point exactly how old he was. If he was really older than he said, she was probably the one who started that lie. Probably because she didn't get married until 1868, and that three- or four-year-old is a pretty big newborn. I was actually thinking that when you were, like, telling her story a little bit. I'm like, the math doesn't really line up. Yeah, I think that she uh, didn't always keep her needlework in her hands when she had a gentleman caller. But now she knows why it's important to keep your needlework in your hands. Yes, yes. So the the big problem here, aside from the weird age discrepancy, was that even when they found Lulu, she didn't want to come identify Carlisle Harris as her husband or testify. I mean, she's already not doing so hot because she got an amateur back alley abortion from her fake husband, who, by the way, was maybe 16 then. And so that affected her health. And then there was scuttlebutt that... Harris had been back in touch with her, letting her know the nasty things that might happen if she helped out the prosecution. She also told the prosecution that she had a rich uncle who said if she did testify, he would disown her, and he was the sole support for her and her mother. So she has a lot of reasons not to. Yes, yes, a lot of reasons not to. And they try to give her a reason to do it. They say, all right, we'll give you a thousand dollars if you come identify him and testify about how he did this to you, this exact same thing that he did to Helen. That's around thirty thousand dollars today and she still says no. She wouldn't do it for millions of dollars. Well, because it's going to destroy her reputation. It's going to put her in the news. And back then, even today, a lot of the victims that do come forward are just viewed as monsters Mm -hmm. a lot of the time. They're not really seen with sympathy. So she doesn't want to ruin the rest of her life for this person who already pretty much ruined her life. 
Like, she's not going any further down that rabbit hole. She learned her lesson. Fuck this guy. Hands off. No. Mm -hmm. And after it happened, after the, the abortion and everything, she said she never wanted to see him again. She is sticking to that. She has just nothing but disgust and hatred in her heart for him because of what he put her through. Well, good. Yeah, I can't blame her. I mean, but subpoenas? <laughs> like, I'm just so confused by the fact that they didn't try a subpoena. Well, when did subpoenas start? I mean, the word's been around for a really long time. I don't know if they were as frequently used as a go-to back then, but, I mean... There's some exceptions to them that maybe would apply or would make the appeals process potentially more... I mean, if they're technically married, you yeah. can't testify against your spouse. Exactly, yes. Um, oh, and also, it, would she be incriminating herself by admitting that he gave her... Or, actually, I don't know if he gave her an abortion. Or he, took, he might have taken her to a hospital for an abortion, but one way or the other... Is she incriminating herself if she admits on the stand that she's had an abortion? And she that's might. one of the exceptions that you're, you know, you're allowed to not testify if you would incriminate yourself. And yeah, does spousal privilege apply? Was she even married? Yeah. Like, it's all very confusing and would probably throw a lot of snags into the, the trial and the appeals process. So that was out of the realm of possibility for the prosecution. They just had to work with all the, all the other stuff they had. And uh, the defense tried to say that Carlisle was even younger than he was and that a man with his pedigree could never commit murder. This is from the defense attorney. Who is this prisoner? He is the grandson of one of the most distinguished men who during a lifetime of 40 or 50 years in this city had honored his city, dignified his profession, and advanced science. Dr. McCready. His mother is a gentle, refined, spiritual-minded woman whose writings are in every house in this country. This man has been an industrious student, pursuing his studies with such avidity at college that before this trouble came upon him, he'd taken the first hospital prize against all competitors. What the heck is the hospital prize? It was probably like a med school thing, like he won the most valuable player. <laughs> it's so weird, though. Like... Okay, we're making healing people into a competition? Sure, whatever. It also comes out in the trial that there had been morphine distributed in his med school class for observation not too long before the murder, and the students all had access to it, and no one was really checking to make sure that the same amount was there after the demonstration as before. So easy access to some morphine. Yeah, like, do you remember in grade school when they would, like, give you something and you'd just pass it around to all your classmates? Mm -hmm. They did that, but with poison. And so somebody could easily pocket a few of those capsules of morphine and then pass the rest along. And by the time it gets to the end and you're a few short, even if you were counting it, there's no way to know which one took it because you pass it around the whole room. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can remember them passing some kind of drug around. I can't remember if it was pills or if it was actually weed, but it had to have been just pills. I don't think they could have pulled off weed, but in the D.A.R.E. program in middle school, I can remember the D.A.R.E. officer saying, I know exactly how much is there, and I better have the same amount when it gets back into my hands. I don't even know why they'd pass it around, but I also got kicked out of the D.A.R.E. auditorium spiel. I couldn't help it. <laughs> they told a story about a kid who was huffing glue out of a plastic bag and then, like, glued it to his own face <laughs> and suffocated. And I fucking laughed so hard that they kicked me out. <laughs> How do you glue it to your own face? <laughs> Only you could get kicked out of the anti-drug program. They were like, no, no, just let her go It's do too drugs. late for her. Get yeah. her the fuck out. <laughs> The theory is that as far as these six pills were concerned, he only loaded one of them up with morphine. And so when she took that one, he'd be fine as long as they only examined the other pills first, which they would do because that's easier, and then didn't do an autopsy. Like, all right, so he, he tells her, I'm giving you these pills, but I'm holding two back, and these are quinine, but one of them is actually fully morphine. He had no way of knowing what order she would take them in. It's, it's kind of a gamble on what day she's going to die at this point. But he still has two pills he's held back. 
So that he can say, hey, this is what I gave her. Yeah, he has evidence that he gave her, you know, something that was totally harmless, supposedly. And then if he presents that evidence, he's banking on them not doing an autopsy because they'll be like, well, I mean, the pills he showed us were fine. So they just assume all the other pills were fine, but they didn't. The thing was, he also thought, well, Cynthia Potts will refuse to have an autopsy done or at least won't request it because that would reveal the abortion. He wasn't banking on Cynthia Potts coming forward and telling everybody. Yeah, because, I mean, at that point, too, like, here's the whole story. This is what happened. I mean, what does she have left, you know? What what does her, her daughter's honor or whatever you want to call it and standing in society matter at this point when she's an innocent victim of murder? One of Helen's friends was deposed by the prosecution and said that Harris had said to her, quote, my prospects will be utterly ruined if this marriage is known. I would rather kill her and kill myself than have the marriage published. I wish that she were out dead and I were out of it. Yep, that de- deposition was read in court. I'm not sure why she couldn't testify, but there you go. The prosecution had their theory of the motive, not so much the escaping of the marriage but rather escaping consequences like the ruination of his career and reputation if all the stuff about the abortion came out. So he's just trying to save his skin. But they also say the prosecution is like, the motive does not matter. Because you are all in this jury like normal dudes. And whatever you think might be a sufficient motive for murder is way, way, way worse than anything that he's got going on. Because he'll murder for whatever reason, you know? And the prosecution in the closing arguments, this is out of uh, six capsules. This is from their final speech. Circumstantial evidence, gentlemen, is not like a chain where one weak link can weaken the entire chain. It is like a rope or cable. Each fact is a strand of that rope. And as we pile one circumstance on another, one fact on another, so we add strands and strength to the rope until we get a cable strong enough to bind the prisoner to justice. That is one way of making your circumstantial evidence seem stronger. With rhetorical flourishes, uh, he ended his argument by inviting the jurors to go with him in their imagination to the grave of Helen Potts, to stand over that grave and, quote, say a few words in praise of her innocent life, which had been taken and hurled into eternity. Let us write an epitaph on her tomb. Murdered innocence. All right, so he, in his closing argument, said, let's write the the epitaph, murdered innocence on her tomb. Just, you know, listeners, hold that in your brain for a few minutes. Let's put a pin in that. Pin that, yeah. And he actually manages, with this closing speech, to get a flinch out of Harris, which seems like it's kind of difficult. But actually, and this is heartbreaking... Cynthia Potts was overheard hoping for a not guilty verdict. Just basically saying, please, God, let him not be guilty. Because if not for her motherly advice, Helen would have tossed out that last pill. And so she feels that if he's guilty, then so is she. She's also responsible in a way. Which she's not. She had no way of knowing. No, she had no way of knowing. But I do hate that she was like, no, just go ahead and take it. Yeah, it's, it's rough. I can't imagine living with that afterwards. So the jury is given instructions that they need to decide between different degrees of murder and uh, a possibility of a manslaughter charge. They have a few questions to answer in order to get there. One, did morphine cause Helen's death? Two, if it did, who gave it to her? So if the answers to one and two are yes and Carlisle Harris, then they have to decide his intent to figure out what level of charge he gets. You know, what's he guilty of? Was he trying to cure a headache? And so it's manslaughter. Or was he trying to murder her? And so it's first degree murder. So off they go at 9.23 p.m. And back in they come at 10.47 p.m., so we have an hour and 24 minutes. And he is found guilty of murder in the first degree, sentenced to death 
on the day before the anniversary of their marriage. Well, I think he was found guilty on the day before the anniversary, and the next day they sentenced him to death by the electric chair on the anniversary. That's pretty apropos. Yeah. The trial, I found this. We don't see too much costs for trials, so this I found interesting. In modern valuation, it, it cost around the city around six hundred and forty thousand dollars. Wow! With the defense costing about half that. Wow. Mm-hmm. So stories start coming out after the trial of other affairs he had had, like the fifteen-year-old serving girl working for his mother, who he knocked up, then took to a maternity hospital, and then abandoned. And when she finally found him, he told her to, quote, get rid of the brat, end quote, and just, you know, put it on somebody's doorstep. Sort of the reverse of Anna's fondlin. Well, you know what, though? Because we, we did a case a while back with the maternity hospital where the women were always just abandoned there. They'd get with, with child and get dropped off and forgotten. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's essentially what happened to her, you know? And there was a man who said... Helen had actually been a morphine addict. He said he was an addict himself and that she'd taken some of his morphine and told him she wanted to just use it for her complexion. Don't worry. And Harris confirmed this whole story. And then he was outed as a fraud who had worked at the Neptune Club. What do yeah, you know? Yeah, and probably gotten a little pay from Harris to come ahead with that story. Probably, yeah. There are appeals... But finally, it's uh, verging on execution time. His mother came to say goodbye. This is from the paper. The mother, whose efforts in all her son's behalf have aroused the sympathy of a nation, whose courage never halted, and whose belief in the innocence of her son has never faltered, broke down in anguish before his cell door and wept. She prayed with her boy that the horrible doom might be averted. And while the guards hardened as they are to human suffering, turned away with moistened eyes, the mother and son kissed and parted for the last time. Yeah, yeah, that's a little overwrought. I mean, yeah, I get it. That's that's rough. But let's, let's maybe think of the other mother here. How about, yeah. And his father visited the day prior to the execution, and this was the first time Harris had seen his father in years. I mean... It's sounding like his father didn't even come to the trial. That's what it sounds like. Very strange. There were 27 witnesses to the execution, seven doctors, 10 journalists, and 10 state officials who just happened to have an in with the warden. You know, so you can go watch people be electrocuted to death. Whenever you feel like it. Yeah. Carlisle Harris came in. He sat right in the chair and asked for permission to speak. And then he said, I have no further revelation to make. I desire to say I am absolutely innocent. Um, I think he was toying with people. Yeah. (laughs) He wanted them to be like, oh, is he, is he going to, is he going to admit it? And he was like, no, I'm innocent. Death was instantaneous. And as the paper put it, quote, the execution was most successful. (sighs) <sighs> they're so blasé. They're like, it's like a dinner party. This was probably discussed over dinner parties. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mrs. Harris slash Hope Ledyard, she did not think that this was, you know, super great. She had a metal plate put on his casket that read, Carlisle Harris, murdered May 8th, 1893, aged 23 years, 7 months, 15 days, We would not if we had known. And then the jury after that, as if to attribute that last bit to somebody on the jury. She also put on her son's chest an affidavit from a juror who wrote that he wouldn't have voted for a guilty verdict if he'd heard testimony from a doctor who said he sold Helen morphine. She also put a notice in the paper the day after the execution. Harris, Carlisle Wentworth, eldest son of Charles L. and Francis McCready Harris, judicially murdered May 8th, 1893. And I feel like she got all of this from that idea of putting murdered innocents on Helen's tomb. 
did you have what the tombstone was engraved with? Okay, there was so much that I did not get to catch the tombstone. Give it to me. So she had the tombstone engraved with murdered by 12 men if the right. jury had only known. Yep. So yeah, she's. I, I swear, as soon as the prosecution said that during the case, she was like, you know, light bulb. Yep. <laughs> My precious baby could not have done this. You all murdered him. So, yes, that was essentially um, the life of him. One thing that I found that it was published in 1893, so the same year that he was executed, a book called, quote, Articles, Speeches, and Poems of Carlisle W. Harris by Carlisle W. Harris and F. McCready Harris. He was allowed to write and be published and make money from it while he was in prison. So he wrote essays and such for newspapers about the conditions in the prison and such. And then she put it all together and made it a book and sold it. Which just feels like... Gross. Yeah, super gross. You know, I hope that she took the money and sent it to, like, you know, a maternity hospital or a home for unwed mothers or something. But she, I doubt it. She did not. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's, uh, that's all I got there, too. As far as that's concerned. Do you have anything else on... Him? I do not. Okay, so recipe time. Uh oh. Uh, I was hoping that in Plain Talks with Young Homemakers by Frances McCready, that there would be some recipes, but in the food section, she just gives kind of general instructions for what to serve and when to serve. No actual recipes, but we did get this. So before we get to our actual recipe, let's talk about her advice on preserving meat. We should never buy chops by the pound. They are so expensive, while the whole quarter is quite cheap. The leg or shoulder will keep a fortnight in winter, or nearly a week in summer if you wrap it in a towel dipped in vinegar and hang it up. Ew. Ew. That doesn't sound quite um, thorough enough to preserve. And also, that meat keeping in the winter is really going to depend on what kind of winter you're having. Yeah, like, if we're talking Florida winter, no. No. Yeah, right? Gosh, I had a tough time choosing between two, and I'm still not sure, but I think I'm going to go with... Go with plan B. (laughs) I'm going to go with lettuce salad with mayonnaise sauce. From the larger cookery book of extra recipes by Agnes B. Marshall. And yeah, some of them were quite extra, all right. Take a nice, crisp, and well-washed lettuce. Cut it up and dry it well. Mix it with two tablespoons of mayonnaise sauce, a tablespoonful of whipped cream, a tablespoonful of tarragon vinegar, and a dust of castor sugar. And use for garnishing entrees or for serving with hot and cold meats. Ew. Just basically um, some chopped lettuce with mayonnaise and whipped cream. Yeah, like that is something. That is something. And like at first I was like, this this might be okay. Because I'm thinking like ranch is made with mayonnaise. Yeah. I've done uh, dressings with, with mayonnaise and vinegar to do like a broccoli salad. And mm-hmm. I was like, it could be okay. And then when you start throwing in sugar... And whipped cream. And whipped cream. I'm like, it's not okay anymore. Yeah, it stopped being okay. And it's just lettuce. Like, it's just, that's just, that's not enough. And I understand, okay, use it as a garnish. All right, maybe nobody will eat it. But then they also say, serve it with meats. No, please don't. And please don't have preserved those meats by hanging them up with vinegar. Yeah, like, I'm just thinking about rancid pork with a dollop of whipped cream on top. (laughs) And I'm like, yum. (laughs) Yum, yum. Let me add it. So, all right. Thank you for that. Mm. You're always welcome. Mm. It's my favorite part is searching for the recipes. And listeners, you can send us recipes of, uh, you know, the olden days when they made yummy, yummy lettuce, mayonnaise, whipped cream salad. And we will read them on the air if they're disgusting enough. And then, you know, after a little while, we'll put some names in a hat or something, and maybe, uh, not maybe, but definitely, uh, give you some merch. But you have to actually send it in to oldtimeycrimey at gmail.com, not on our social media. And just this week, newspapers.com rolled out a new feature where they have links to all of this stuff 
on their site right underneath the search bar. They they know. They, they know. know what you're there looking for. Yeah, they figured it out. After the seventh week of me typing in the word recipe and then a year, <laughs> the same year that, you know, our murder took place, they're like, hmm, somebody's really into the recipes. So they We have, should make this a feature. Yeah, let's do this. So uh, newspapers.com, you're welcome for the inspiration. I do what I can. So yeah, uh, send us those. Just take a screenshot, whatever. And um, yeah, but social media or Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, I am been super lazy and not doing a whole lot. I'll try to put a couple things up, but you know, it's there's a lot of pain involved in sitting at my desk <laughs> these days, so it's kind of fallen by the wayside, and that's fine. I think the the main content is right here, us talking about crazy, stupid murders. Crazy, stupid murders. Mm-hmm. So and. Um, yeah, that's really all I got. I'm sure there's more, but I don't feel like it. And also, I have to pee. I have to pee really bad, too. She made me drink water. I'm trying to cut down on our mouth noises. But also, I am dehydrated, but now I really have to pee. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, what you doing this week? Uh, peeing. Oh, my God, that's all I can think about. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, do I have anything? I don't think I have anything, like, huge planned. I don't know. What are you doing this week? Um, I'm going to finish watching The Gilded Age and take baths. That's what I'm going to do. That sounds pretty awesome. Yeah, it's going to be pretty awesome. I have, like, aqua therapy, so a lot of time spent in water, essentially. And, uh, Short Story Short Podcast is on spring break. Hooray! So I uh, have uh, off from that. So I'm just going to be, you know, reading about old crimes. Oh, you know what? I do know something I'm doing that is not just me working myself to death. Uh, I am teaching the kids how to play tennis. Oh! So I got our tennis rackets out, and uh, it's actually getting a little bit nicer here. Not this weekend or next weekend, but during the week, it's sunny and lovely. So <laughs> I have them outside learning how to uh, hit balls off of my shed. Oh. And um, they have to go on opposite sides of the shed because otherwise they will just swing at each other. And um, I don't want to do a new timey crimey with toddlers. <laughs> yeah. That is adorable. So you actually are going to be attending a tennis party. Yeah, so I have my own little tennis party. I'm going to have a picnic. A little tennis club in your own home. I might do a picnic actually now. That would be really fun. I'm yeah. kind of thinking of doing a picnic <laughs> at a tennis party. Oh, I just remembered I, something I'm doing. I'm, I'm starting to look into and, and get uh, set up for doing acupuncture for my chronic pain. So that's that's starting this week. I'm going to be looking into that and hopefully getting an appointment soon. So. Take a picture because I really want to see you stuffed full of needles. Oh, there will be pictures. There good. will be pictures. Good, good. All right. And that's all for us because I'm going to burst. Same here. All right. Thank you, listeners, so much for spending time with us. We really appreciate it. And we hope you have a fantastic weekend full of, you know, um, errant tennis balls and no needles. <laughs> Or needles, if you're into that sort of thing. And uh, also, don't get married under fake names. Just going to put that out there. Yeah, don't get married under fake names, and don't let your spouse perform abortions on you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, unless they're qualified even, then probably not. No, no, no. no. Yeah, just no. Probably, probably bad. So, and I think there's rules against that. Thank God. So, all right. Um, bye. Bye. Now, like we said, doesn't work 100% of the time. Oh, I'm not going to use that pun. <laughs> I said he had a plan B. If no, no, no plan B. No. So he... <laughs> I need a second. <laughs> I don't know what state I was in when I put that into my notes. <laughs> I knew no. what I was doing. I knew no. what I was doing. <laughs> and now I'm like, well, what was wrong with me? <laughs> Why would you do that? That is awful. I'm just going to put all this at the end. <laughs>